G'day guys, my name's uh, Edward Farrell, and I'm here to uh, talk about red teaming. Uh, whatever it is, whatever we're doing right now, uh, I've found has just been really poor. We've sucked at it. Uh, there's no other way to, to say it. And I think it, it's been something I've been probably witnessing in the second half of 2016. A lot of organisations getting sold red teaming or, or trying to engage red teaming without fully understanding what it's all about. And this has probably been a, a big motivation on some of the material I've been writing and generating and presenting on. Um, certainly at, at, at various stages in the last two years, but uh, more so in the past couple of months uh, as we start seeing a, a bit of expansion in InfoSec or cyber or, or whatever it's getting called nowadays. So uh, I guess first and foremost, I, I wanted to introduce a bit of context um, about what it is, what it is and, and where it's come from. Um, what's wrong with the market right now, if you, uh, as well as also going to some of the characteristics uh, of what uh, of what it's all about, and also understanding some of our shortfalls. I also just wanted to finish off with a couple of slides on just some real-world examples uh, my team and I have, uh, have had uh, over the past uh, couple of months in some of the work we have done. So first and foremost, what isn't a red team? Uh, one thing I've observed a lot of recently has been a red team being sold as something a little more than a, an automated vulnerability assessment. And it's important to start differentiating between all of these things. Um, now that a lot of pen testing firms and uh, a lot of technology firms now have people selling security, there's the belief that a lot of it is little more than a change in the language you're using when those terms of reference or whatever you're selling has some bearing to, to what the actual task is. So we now start seeing people not differentiating between uh, red teaming, pen testing, vulnerability assessments, and all these other subsets of uh, digital assurance. Uh, and so uh, all of a sudden there's this automated notion of, all right, give us a couple of IP addresses, we'll run a scanner against them, um, we make some money, we've done a red team, uh, and we ride off into the sunset. So we now know what a red team is, and, but I, I guess this is always back to what what does a red team actually constitute? And five, seven years ago, a colleague of mine, um, I was actually saying, hey, why don't we get into this? And he, he sort of broached that question, and he said, well, look, at the end of the day, a lot of the red teams that you see out there, uh, and this is going back um, you know, almost a decade now, were really just purely about breaking in to prove that a break-in can be done. Um, uh, this has been a really interesting series of cartoons I've come across uh, in the past uh, couple of months. Um, on explaining uh, certain aspects of security uh, in a cartoon strip. And, and this was actually fairly accurate, I found, of, all right, so this now starts to become a step up from our existing security activities too. We're trying to understand as defenders, one, we're ready, and two, what is exactly happening out there and, and how we're going get, to get attacked. But uh, I guess... For me, my thought or, or my very sort of broad definition of this is we're trying to make things better uh, by subjecting them to what is actually going to happen in the real world. And from there, we can have all these other effects of we, we're preparing the defence, we're providing a, a holistic understanding of where security's at, um, and we're, we're really starting to explore a little bit of, of what our organisation is doing. Now, I think it's important to understand some of the historical application where the context of red teams come from, and this is where uh, the, the title of my talk actually came from, was uh, back, in, um, back many years ago, the uh, Catholic Church actually had to introduce what they called a devil's advocate because all of a sudden everyone was becoming a saint because everyone was doing all these miracles. Sounds exactly like some of the product security we're seeing out there in that... Uh, everything will magically work because of magic. So uh, what had happened was the, the Vatican at the time decided to install a, a few people uh, who were referred to as the devil's advocate who were there to inject a bit of doubt into to what was happening. Uh, the uh, end state of that, we had, uh, I guess you could say, a, a higher bar for saints uh, and therefore a, a, higher, uh, a higher quality uh, of saints out there. Now, in the, the 20th century, uh, as, uh, as armies started to mature, they started uh, introducing 
a, a very similar concept uh, around red teams where plans would be rehearsed before they're executed. So it was uh, no longer, okay, we're, we're going over the, 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 the top of the trenches and walking towards the enemy very slowly because it's the 17th time we've done it and they're not going to expect it again. So all of a sudden they now actually had uh, events like this one on uh, the uh, on your right hand side where they would have a, an exercise without troops where they'd be planning things uh, on paper where a I guess you could say a blue team would be able to assess, visualize how their plan was going to work and then you'd have uh, individuals standing up subjecting them to all sorts of abuse. No, your plan's not going to work, this is actually going to kill a bunch of people. And it's better to know that before that event took place. So all of a sudden we start seeing the practicality of subjecting a plan or an idea to some form of aggression or, or before, it's, uh, before it actually has any real world consequences. So I, I guess the important thing here is that security and cybersecurity isn't the only place where we've uh, seen this concept of a red team exists. And, and you'll see it in a lot of other spaces where uh, there is a need to subject something to, uh, to, to some form of review in order to validate that what is taking place is correct. Uh, we've now seen, probably in the last 20 years, the exact same practice take place uh, in technology in, in what we've now had it as a, as a subset of assurance. Its intent is to, to provide some level of guarantee that something is working properly and is functioning. And to, to what level that goes to and, and how that's done really starts dividing into all these little subset areas of assurance where uh, whether it's, say, a, a web application test or a, a, another form of uh, security assessment, it, it really starts to, to start getting a little bit grey. Um, for me, this really comes back to, to stepping back uh, and finding a way of, of how does this tie in with other security activities. So uh, I guess there's no set way of doing it without at least understanding context. And I, and I guess this is where we have to start not boxing into anything, but start looking at some of the characteristics of how a red team exists. So first and foremost to me, a red team has to have some sort of business focus. Um, the target here is not a technology or a an individual or even just the business as a whole, it's the holistic organisation and, and how it all works together. Um, now that can have either a technical focus, it can even have say a, a social or a physical focus, but those are all things that tend to be extrapolated out in at least some understanding of, of context and that's certainly one of the other characteristics that falls into play here is that there is usually a heavy form of developing an understanding, whether that's through some, some form of reconnaissance or, or mapping out a, a company to actually understand what they're about. Um, so, for example, there'll be certain organisations where, where, they're, uh, so where they will perform one specific function that may not be readily targetable, readily exploitable, but say because there's a, a financial back end to it, that back end may in fact uh, be a, a more easily identifiable target. Now, the, the other point I, I tend to find as well is uh, a lot of these assessments tend to focus less on compliance or on paperwork or on delivering a, a 400 page report. Um, so the, the last uh, two or three engagements we've had with our team, our report has been a four page executive summary and a five, 10 minute video explaining what exactly took place and why. Uh, the intent of this is, is much less around a, uh, passing a paperweight uh, examination and more about providing some valuable intelligence to an organisation. Now I said we, we suck at it and this is a, I guess you could say, a very personal opinion of it. Um, and there's a few reasons why I believe that happens. Uh, first and foremost, I don't think a lot of companies have been subjected to a threat that warrants this depth of assessment or at least that's the feeling. Um, of course, there's always the, uh, the flip side of that is, um, is, well, you don't really know that until it does happen. So 
you're kind of then in two mindsets. Well, do I explore that and, you know, and understand what it is, or do I not care about it and, and stick my head in the sand? I also tend to find that it's usually a lot of the security activities now are getting pushed uh, on the technological side, so the only interest is really in understanding how well defended uh, a, a piece of information technology is, as opposed to the whole organisation. So cybersecurity is, uh, is more often than not viewed as a, a function of, uh, of the information or the technology side of the business, not as a, a wholly integrated piece. So all of a sudden, security is... That's computers, right? It's, it's all just about computers, and that's it. Um, funnily enough, most of the, the work our team has done has been fairly effective around uh, recovering data from uh, breaches such as LinkedIn and being able to reuse that to leverage or, or gain access into an organisation. Following on from that, there's the whole idea that technology is product driven and, and it's also a, a big piece with around how cybersecurity gets sold. Selling a box or a as-a-service platform is going to be far easier uh, for an organisation trying to get a, a trying to sell business. So all of a sudden, this whole process uh, in cybersecurity of of being able to go through, evaluate an organisation, and understand what it's about is far less lucrative. And so, if you're a salesperson, that's not what you're going to be selling. Um, I also look at some of the, the paradigms and control elements we have in security, and for a lot of people, a red teaming engagement means that they're going to have to let go of some control of what happens. Uh, and in a lot of places, that can be a little bit too much, especially where there's often a, I guess you could say, a, a fiefdom-style control of, of where an organisation's culture exists. And you see that certainly in some of the subjective framing we put around pen tests where um, one pen test uh, that uh, we've been asked to, to go for, a, where they've asked for it, they've specifically asked for a red team engagement for no other reason to actually scare the hell out of the business. Um, and that's just so that they can have that buy-in and that justification of, look, we need to make an investment in this. The information we hold is particularly sensitive, and if we don't do this, well, someone else is going to someone else is going to, and it's actually going to put us on the back foot. But then you also have on the other side uh, the idea of, all right, I, I need to demonstrate uh, to the boss that we're fine, get off my back, I know some, I, I know some cybersecurity salesperson is talking to you, I've just got to prove that's a, a complete crock, we're fine. Um, where I like to start shaping this when I start dealing with a lot of my customers is most of the, is the actual assurance activity that takes place needs to start focusing on, all right, are you getting value out of the activities you're, you're doing and are you spending in the, your money correctly? Um, something I've found about two, and it, it all started to start coming together about two or three years ago, and it ties in a bit with, um, with Eric's talk this morning. You go into most IT organisations, they're severely understaffed, they're fighting fires, they're, they don't have that situational awareness. Um, and then tell you, you say, all right, guys, tools down. Let's just start talking through what's going on here and probably why you need to justify spending your money on another staff member as opposed to a bunch of technology is all of this. Um, it's also about being holistic in your approach of, all right, are we doing things right? And um, the engagements I've found where clients have gotten a lot of value out of this is where they take on that, that objective focus of, all right, what am I doing wrong? and how do I fix it? And it's not necessarily going to be a product fix or maybe even a, uh, a process fix, but what, what's going on and what do I need to be thinking about? And, and finally, and this is one that I think still uh, hasn't been explored enough uh, anywhere, is actually using it to rehearse the defence. So all of a sudden, red team does X, all right, blue team, what's your response? Um, having that constant toing and froing uh, as a rehearsal exercise uh, can prove quite valuable, especially when you start coming down to a, a lot of the pen testing activities uh, that I'm sure a lot of the, the pen testers in this room do. We'll often find that they'll be uh, inside an organisation within 
uh, you know, within a couple of hours, which is usually a lot faster than how the defense is going to be able to respond. But then I also find on my own side, um, as a red teamer, um, one of the things you tend to find is when you come from a technological background, you start getting tunnel vision on specific technologies or you start diving into specific problems that look like, hey, this is actually probably where there's going to be, be some trouble. If you go upstairs and look at the CTF, you're probably going to find a couple of guys who are spending four hours on, the 100, on one of the 100 level challenges when they can pick up 800 points in eight or nine other challenges. And this is, this is something I've personally had a, a lot of where, all right, let's just step back, let's have a look. I'm a bad guy, how am I going to make this someone's worst day? The other thing I find is, is a lot of people who, uh, who have not actually had them, uh, who have not practiced uh, working as an adversary or, or been on the, the offensive side much, or have just had their first exposure to it, tend to start getting a little bit crazy. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to put it. And so all of a sudden there's this desire that really only comes natural, this desire to start dominating other human beings because you're in a position to do so. And this is, this is something you'll see uh, quite, um, well, not as frequently as you'd think, but it, it happens. And so that actually needs to get stepped back. And this really comes down to your job isn't to overwhelm people and do harm. It's about making things a little bit better. So if you start getting a little bit too aggressive, you're actually doing more harm than good. So there comes this point where you actually need to temper it before someone's head explodes because they're getting overwhelmed. So on the subject of poor execution, one thing I, I tend to observe is a lot of larger companies um, really don't perform this as effectively as, say, a, a smaller uh, organisation. That's not a, a reflection on their intent. It's just when you get to a certain size, there, there tends to be a, a focus on mature systems and processes that may not be effective in, uh, in a red team engagement or there tends to be a, now an innovative approach that needs to take place. And how you structure that, I, I think, tends to be, be quite difficult. I've, yeah, it, it's just, it, it's one of those things, and I think that's going to be an interesting challenge, is how do we start scaling these activities? Um, there also is a, a whole mindset of, of how do we delineate between the red team and the blue team? Do we start doing this purple team concept where we have a, 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 an ad, someone who is versed in, in the adversarial side of thinking embedded in the blue team and do we still retain some level of objectivity around our assessment or, or vice versa? And also, do we make sure that both teams understand that this isn't a competition, this is about making things better? And so all of a sudden you'll start seeing both, or both sides of the table getting really, really uh, heated up uh, about who's done what, where and what's happened and what's gone wrong and everything's your fault. And it can be, be quite immature how that happens. I also tend to find that a lot of, uh, a lot of the uh, offensive teams that, uh, that engage in some of these activities don't actually go into a lot of depth. And that's because the, the reality, in order to be successful, I just need to be be able to break in once when it's like, well, there's, there's actually going to be a depth of reasons why something has failed. And, and if you don't go to any length to understand those root causes, you're really not providing any value to that business besides, hey, here's this one little bug here. You, you can fix that bug and you're fine. It's like, well, no, there's a reason why that bug occurred. Why? So being able to go in and understand that is, is fairly important. So how do you set up for, for success in this? And for any prospective red teamers, there's a few individual traits that I, I think you need to have. Um, the first one is, is Wheaton's rule, don't be a dick. Um, yeah, don't be a dick. It's, you're not here to get cocky and, and carry on like a, a rock star. You're there to provide a professional service. Um, and if you can take that model of trust and really build upon it, um, it's going to take you a few years, but you'll get to a point where you're actually in a really good space in this industry. Being proficient, and what do I mean by that? It's, it's about not only just having the technical knowledge that, 
that most of these schools demand, but also understanding how a business functions, how it works, and even understanding how a human works and how the human mind uh, operates, and then being able to use that uh, should there be, say, a social engineering component to an engagement. Understanding the context of the business um, is incredibly important, and even the context of some of the things that you're testing as well. So being able to identify bugs in systems that really aren't holding anything may not be uh, a valuable use of your time compared to, say, evaluating uh, other systems that may take a little bit more time, may have a bit more depth and complexity, but understanding what those are about and why those should be your priority of effort are important. Control measures are a, another thing um, within a, a, a successful engagement. Being able to say, yep, this is what we're testing and why, um, and then knowing where to, to have your limits, uh, that is really a, a, a big part of what you're doing. It gives that confidence to the blue team as to what's happening. Uh, that doesn't mean you layer uh, your engagement with, uh, with controls. Um, being able to have planning material and, and communications as well uh, is also uh, important just to reinforce that confidence with the, the blue team and also um, being able to have that knowledge transfer with the blue team as well. But uh, another important one is get creative. And this is one of the tutorials we're going to be having a little bit later uh, upstairs is on creating a, a Dropbox. And it's interesting when I introduce some of this to uh, a lot of our customers. I'm not too sure if you can read that, but we had this wonderful do not remove uh, label on this box that we plugged into a network that we were just able to walk straight into the company uh, to. But um, the idea behind this box is to give us access to an internal network um, when we're not going to be able to sit down with a laptop and, and start doing things. It also gave us a, a secondary link when we got caught. So uh, this particular engagement we had, I was able to hang around for about 45 minutes and then just walk out, uh, and I was still able to maintain access. Um, also gave us uh, an opportunity to a, a man in the, the middle attack because they, they didn't have uh, uh, they didn't have any appropriate controls at, uh, at layer two to to prevent us from uh, from attacking. Uh, then, just a, it gave us that foothold into the organisation. It gave the defensive team something else to think of. Uh, social engineering emails are always great. Um, Jira sites especially say if the the focus on a company is uh, around development, but. OWARE is something I absolutely love because a lot of places still use it. They don't put in two-factor auth, and everyone's convinced it's, it's fine. So a really awesome attack is using this as a means of social engineering and then leveraging any internal access after that to target other internal uh, users. Once again, those are one of those engagements that you really have to brief quite, um, quite thoroughly just so that you under so the company understands that there's going to be human interaction uh, and it could backfire, and it, you know, making sure that you set yourself up not to backfire. Uh, another engagement I had a couple of weeks ago was uh, on the 15th floor of a company in Sydney where, um, where these guys were uh, using a WPA2 enterprise wireless network with MS Chat V2 set on it, so we were just waiting for phones to walk by and automatically connect to a rogue access point we had on the other side of the fire escape to, to get credentials. Um, yeah. So this, this next one really isn't one that was, uh, was specific against one of our clients, but this was just something we found through a really detailed reconnaissance was Google was indexing um, emails on a particular product uh, that this client had used. So this was a big awareness thing for them. It was also a big awareness for the vendor in question as well, um, uh, who actually went away and said, yeah, look, this was actually very much uh, our fault on a configuration setting we had across a number of these clients. So, you know, thanks for your help. And, and that's now gone on to, to help a few other organisations, uh, of particular note, a, a bank. Uh, I got a thank you. I didn't even get a T-shirt. <laughs> um, but I, I guess the big reason why I wanted to do, deliver this talk today, and really one of the things I wanted everyone to get out of this was, uh, at the end of the day, 
this entire concept of red teaming is around challenging the assumptions of an organisation and what their thoughts are on security um, and calling bullshit when it needs to be called. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of real sort of subtle. <sighs> there's a lot of real. Uh, tools and applications that are coming out that really aren't providing any value. And I think the more we can call things for what they are, the, the better we're going to be setting up companies for success. <laughs>